Welcome to Melt University's 2020 Summer Program. This year, our virtual intern program will help you build your brand, inform you on a variety of career paths, and introduce you to top executives in sports and marketing. Here's your host, President and CEO of Melt, one of the largest independent sports and event marketing agencies in the country, Vince Thompson. Welcome, students. Virtual Melt University Summer 2020 and our podcast roll along and I promise you this podcast today's podcast is going to be if not your favorite one of your top three favorites he's going to be talking about an industry that you love the live event business the music festival business with uh, an event that we all love one of the most famous the biggest uh, in the country, the Hangout uh, Music Fest, and the founder, uh, who's an amazingly successful entrepreneur, who's an amazing successful retailer, an amazing successful hospitality and restaurant tour, real estate developer, uh, Shaul Zislin, the founder of uh, the Hangout uh, in Gulf Shores, where I spent my childhood, the Gulf restaurants, you may have seen them, Sunliner Diner, uh, we can talk about careers in the hospitality business uh, as well, but um, the Hangout Music Fest is absolutely one of the premier music festivals in the country. I've been privileged to have a ringside seat to the growth of it. I've been privileged to have a ringside seat uh, and work together with Shaul, who's one of my dearest friends, uh, one of the most brilliant, creative people that you're going to know, but as you're familiar, with the exception of this year, it's always held in Gulf Shores, Alabama in the middle of May, and it's become a premier, uh, and it's a fascinating story. We'll talk about that a little bit as well, but he's had just the top artists. Um, Beck, My Morning Jacket, Tom Petty, Stevie Wonder, the Black Keys, the Killers, the Avid Brothers. We got some, I got a great couple of great stories he'll tell you out of that. Uh, but graduated uh, with a degree from the University of Calgary with a bachelor's in economics. And uh, Shell and his lovely wife, uh, lovely wife Lily, um, in talking about career twists and turns, sort of discovered Gulf Shores, fell in love with the beaches and sort of the charm. Uh, like I said, I grew up there um, uh, many, many years ago. I wish I'd kind of had figured it out well, but uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a great ride today. Uh, so, Joel, welcome uh, to our uh, podcast today. It's an honor to have you on. Thank you. I'm worried. I can't get any better than this. Maybe we should just end it now with this. Great <laughs> we should, I should, uh, we should, uh, we should exit stage early, but, uh, but, you know, we've got a lot of kids. We have hundreds of kids signed up listening, amazing, you know, amazing networking opportunities, but, uh, and, and, and we'll talk about the, the future live events and, and where you see the careers going uh, in the live event and the music festival business. But uh, tell us, uh, I know the story pretty well. But, you know, I would be willing to, to, to bet that many of our listeners have been to the Hangout Music Festival or they aspire to go. They aspire to go this year. You had a monster lineup sold out in, you know, five minutes or so. But talk about sort of the genesis of the Hangout Music Festival, because you didn't really set out to be one of the most prolific music, music festival producers, you know, in the world. But so you, because you had sort of a business strategy and a business reason that you started it, right? Right. So just one correction. So once we did set our mind to it, we wanted to be the best in the world from mm -hmm. day one, mm -hmm. uh, just like anything else that we do. Uh, but how we came, it, well, how it came about was definitely not a prolonged process of a decision that this is the industry, this is the space we want to be in. We were looking, we had a vacuum. Uh, to fill in the hospitality business and said, how can we drive traffic in a highly seasonal business? Uh, the business was new at the time. It was the hangout restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, and as you, as you mentioned from familiarity with the area come August 15th, uh, it's like somebody shut down the faucet and it stays shut until basically uh, Memorial day. Mm -hmm. So in our quest to find how do we, what can we do to open that faucet, even if just a little bit during that period, this what was called the off season back then. We don't call that anymore. Now we call it the preseason. We mm -hmm. don't have the off season anymore. Now it's, we got season and preseason. Uh, so, in, you know, we were looking, it was a bike rally. You know, we wanted to do a Harley Davidson biker rally or 
uh, cooking events or many different things. As you know from familiarity, we ended up doing a great music festival just to extend the season by one weekend. Uh, we ended up doing the NCAA volleyball tournament. and We got another weekend added to it. Mm-hmm. Then we went and invented the uh, North American National Oyster Cook-Off in the fall and added another weekend. So if you think about it, we've added three stellar weekends Mm -hmm. to a season that only lasts 15. So we basically added 20% of business opportunity to our, uh, to, to, to a problem that we had that was in, in the hospitality business. It wasn't even in the live event space. So that's kind of how it came about is solving a problem in one business and finding through that an opportunity in, in, in a number of other businesses. Yeah, because if you're in a resort or a <clears throat> resort destination, if you don't have heads and beds uh, and people in your restaurants, then it's just a, it's just a, a bare naked uh, economic weekend. And so students, if you step back and look at the brilliance of the strategy, they defined a quote unquote problem, they find a gap, found an opportunity in the marketplace filled it with things that were fun, but had a, had a business strategy behind it. But the story of 2010, which I still don't believe has been told totally properly. We might have to do a documentary on that one day, but literally three weeks show before the, I think it's three before the inaugural hangout music fest had its giant stellar lineup. As I recall, I think John legend was going to perform and some others. Um, the, BP British Petroleum oil spill hit. And for many of our listeners, they may have been 10 years old because believe it or not, that was 10 years ago. But literally three weeks before your festival, you've got all of this money, all of this investment, all of these resources, all this money committed to production and talent and, and all these things. This oil spill hits, correct? Yeah, I, I you no, know, it, it distinctly remember uh, reading it in an old school, old fashioned newspaper with with a picture of that burning rig. That uh, <laughs> I think it was a, a Wednesday or a Thursday. I remember that morning looking at like, and first it was a human story about people dying in a, in a rig explosion, and nobody thought more of it. You know, I mean, we're like, wow, the rig exploded in the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, seven people or whatever it was lost their lives, and it was a horrible thing, and. We didn't think twice, and then it went quiet for a couple of days, if you remember, and then mm-hmm. and then it started. The story started gaining momentum and started brewing that this may be a bigger problem than just an explosion in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, you know, within weeks, it developed. Uh, you know, here we are, three weeks before it happens, and then two mm-hmm. weeks before, you know, the whole world is starting looking at this well that is not being uh, is not controllable. And a week into it, a week before, you know, all hell breaks loose at that point. You know, it's two weeks of oil pumping. Now these oil slicks are not contained. They're not just in front of Louisiana anymore. It starts traveling along the Gulf Coast. The panic sets in, Uh, you know, big government steps in. I mean, it it was almost surreal. Um, Then we started fielding calls from agents and, and managers of like, we don't know if it's safe to send our people there. If you remember those first, oh, yeah. weeks, you know, it was like the black plague has taken over, you know, the tar, you know, CNN showing tar balls everywhere and the, and the poor Pelican that is completely covered in oil. And, right. you know, I had managers saying we, we can't come there and we had to fight that on. And, uh, you know, the decision had to be made whether we're going on, if it's going to go on or not. And, uh, governor Riley was the governor of Alabama at the time. And he came down and there was a whole assessment and we met with BP and governor and everybody. And I said, look, uh, as long as we're not putting people in harm's way, we want to go forward with this. We think this is important. So you said, so you, so there was never any doubt that because people forget this, first of all, there was a live stream of the, of the spewing going on 24 seven on CNN. And then for some unbelievable reason, the target of the flow of the oil was was ground zero was Gulf Shores and Orange Beach. This yeah. is happening in real time. And so you said, damn the torpedoes. Was there ever any doubt in your mind that you were you were going to cancel? 
You know, Vince, in the world of entrepreneurship, sometimes you can you come out okay with something thinking that you made the right decision. At the, at the time of the decision, I really didn't have a choice. I'm $4 million on the hook. <laughs> right. okay? wow. I mean, it's kind of like it's, at that point, uh, you know, I mean, I, they're, they're closing it down. There was no option. There was, mm-hmm. no, there was not a, really an insurance policy to cover it at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, calling it quits was just not an option. So we, we kind of like hung on and said, hey, whatever this takes, we're going to have to ride it through and try and make it to the other side. And, and did, and did we you did. have any, any talent that would not come perform or did most of them come? You know, it's hard to think back 10 years back. I think if I'm not mistaken, a couple of bands did, uh, did cancel. And, and and again, I don't remember exactly, and I don't don't we don't need to get into the, mm-hmm. into the to to it calling it out now. But let me tell you, we spent the days the the artist relations department said definitely spent days leading up, uh, assuring people that they will not be taken over by the black tar as they step out of the car, <laughs> that we can perform in a safe and orderly environment, and all all that. Uh, uh, Gray Spotter, Gray Spotter said it great, you know, and, and then we got the media attention, right? Then we were like, oh, yeah. what are these guys doing? You know, I mean, like they're really running a music festival on the beach with the tar balls threatening to take over. Oh, yeah. So we got all the media attention um, and and the artists kind of like, you know, being artists, they like the attention. So they started participating. Uh, Gray Spotter said the this is like Coachella on the beach, just nicer. and down with BP, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I was it was crazy, and so, <clears throat> so full speed ahead down the tornadoes. You do it, um, you know. You were supposed to get say thirty, forty thousand. I think you got ten to fifteen thousand, which, uh, as I recall from the articles, was amazing. But then, students, the pivot that Shoal and Lily and the team made, and the idea uh, of how he pivoted. To me, is one of the best ideas in the planet. Uh, Shaul had the idea to say, okay, let's flip and invert this messaging. Let's figure out a way to get people back to say, to see, hey, the seafood is safe. The beaches are safe. Uh, it's safe to come back uh, and visit our, uh, our beautiful beaches. He had built this infrastructure for this festival. And I, tune, I started hearing about it because I'm reading about it because my parents live down in that area. And I tune in on this amazing Saturday night on CMT, Country Music Television at the time. And I see one of the most amazing sights in my life. I see tens of thousands of people. And Jimmy Buffett is performing in basically his hometown. Uh, Talk about, and and it was the best strategy ever of how that all came together. Because then you did a series with, say, Brad Paisley and John Bon Jovi and all these guys. It was just, to me, the most, one of the most brilliant strikes ever. So when we, when Hangout Music Fest ended and we saw that people came, um, you know, again, those days of BP oil spill are still somewhat surreal. I mean, uh, you know, you talk the period that we're in right now, talk about some dystopian, surreal stuff happening all around us in this country. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, in that region, it was very similar feeling, very mm-hmm. eerie, no tourists, right? Because the tourists are listening to the media and staying away for no reason. For no real reason, by For the no way. reason. Uh, but, you know, here we are sitting with retail stores that are catering to tourists and restaurants that are catering to tourists, and nobody's coming. Uh, very early on, BP did what was the responsible thing to do from their point of view and letting people know, don't worry, we will, we will compensate you. We will step in. We will compensate you. Mm-hmm. I had the problem of them doing that. And, again, very, a lot of parallelism to what's happening today by them saying to people, don't worry, we got your paycheck covered. People chose to stay at home and get a paycheck rather than come to work and get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. You know, again, a lot of parallelism with what's going on right now. And what what I did is I went to BP and said, A, if a Hangout employee is going to come to you and say, or a surf style employee come to you and ask for BP relief funds, I need you guys to send us an email so we can verify that indeed this person does not have a job because we're still hiring. We think that there is a strategy that we can stay in business, right? Because we didn't know if we're going to stay in business or not. Mm-hmm. We didn't know at the time. We didn't know if this is a 10-year impact. Is this Exxon Valdez? Is this what, what's going to what's going to go on? We didn't know. Um, so when we started these negotiations with BP, 
I had the fortunate to meet some of the strategic thinkers in BP. And I said, hey, you know, we saw that people are coming for music. Why don't you guys, instead of paying X amount of dollars in 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 in, in penalties and in compensa- in compensatory funds to local businesses, let's seed the local economy. Let's drive, let's force drive these tourists to come down here. And we built a model for them, an economic model showing that if we can bring 10,000 people on a weekend to the beach, how much, uh, you know, how many turns in the economy that causes and what's the economic benefit and, and so on. And very quickly, not the marketing department or anything, it was literally the accounting department of BP that said, if you can pull it off, we're, we'll give you the budget to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, they gave us a pretty handsome budget to do this. Mm-hmm. We, we teamed up with the local tourism board. And the first one that we did uh, was the, you know, we went straight for who would represent this more than anybody else. And it was Jimmy Buffett. And we booked him, you know, again, you can't book acts like this on a dime, but we were ready by like the beginning of July to book him. So within 30 days, we put it all together. Wow. Um, we built the show. We convinced BP. They put up the bill. Everything was ready to go. And a week, 10 days before the, the show, uh, hurricane, I forgot the name, but there was a hurricane warning for that area. And we had to call the show off and basically postpone it by two weeks. You know, I don't remember that. I forgot oh, yeah. that. The, the first, well, he actually ended up coming to town and performed at Lulu's, his sister's restaurant yeah. there doing yeah. a, an acoustic performance uh, because we had everything ready and it was, you know, we, we, we didn't know how to do it. Uh, we ended up postponing by two weeks got a deal done with CMT to televise it live to show people around the country that we're mm-hmm. alive and well. Uh, till this day, I believe it was the number one ever live broadcast uh, for CMT. Jimmy Jimmy Buffett killed it. It was a phenomenal show. Oh, amazing. Yeah. I remember Jimmy coming off and telling his old manager, Harold, uh, Howard Kaufman, saying, best show ever. You know, as, and literally as he's sweating coming off the stage. Um. Mm-hmm. So we did this and the model proved itself. A lot of people made a lot of money. We put 45,000 people, guests. The way we structured it is that you had to stay in a condominium there in order to get the tickets. So the tickets were free, but you had to book a room. Mm -hmm. And it worked and BP liked it. And it's interesting, Vince, because you know that because you helped. We we both tried to do more of it. That's how me and you met. Right. Um, It was so hard to get talent to support it because of the bad association with BP. And we had to go to people and say, you're not, you're not supporting BP, you're supporting the affected community. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were lucky to be able to do it with Brad Paisley. He, he got the message. Uh, John Bon Jovi, me and you, as you know, try to put a few of them together that didn't work out politically because the talent was afraid of it, yep. uh, which is a shame. But uh, I'm glad to be, you know, we ended up doing these three mega shows. <laughs> if you think about it, it's 150,000 people that we brought to the beach. Uh, each one of them spent an average of four room nights. So, you know, that's 200,000 room nights in total that we brought to the, to the beach. And the economic impact of that is just huge. So BP ended up saving a lot of money by seeding that, you know, whatever it was, $8 million in production fees that they paid. Um, well, I, I th- again, I think it's, uh, and, and like I said, I remember watching that show it was one of the most magical nights probably in the history of Gulf Shores and Orange Beach because the sun was setting and, you know, Buffett, you know, being from that area and his sister having an emotional connection. Uh, I still think it's one of the most brilliant business strategies ever. And so the message to our students, to our kids is like, there's always going to be obstacles. You're always going to get thrown off the saddle and within chaos, there is opportunity as there's going to be, um, chaos and opportunity in a post COVID world. We don't know what that looks like yet. I mean, you're in the, you've been in the throes. I remember we talked right before, right after the st- things kind of started hitting the fan in March, cause I was getting ready to do our, you know, our 18th final four and those kind of things. And, and um, we're like, you know, Hey, we're in the destination business. We're in the event business. We're in the people business. We're in the food service business. We're in the live music business. And so uh, before we move into that, into that history, uh, you know, listeners, you know, Shaul and his staff have worked with the greatest musicians ever. And he's got story after story after story 
um, that we could go on for hours, you know, sharing. And but one sticks out to me because I was there. Um, you were you had CeeLo on a bill show, and I think CeeLo sometimes has a propensity or proclivity to sort of be late for his performances. Uh, he happened to be late. Uh, you had uh, the Foo Fighters. You had Dave Grohl. Uh, talk about that a little bit, and if there are any other any other favorites that you think our students would listen to, because what you'll hear students is out of everything, every thread of obstacle or challenges or opportunity, Shoal finds a way to create something very good and very positive out of that, and that is a huge life lesson you need to learn very early in life. You know, again, thank you. I mean, I, I should definitely, when I'll do enough interesting things, I know who to call to, to pack, package it all up. But yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the key, the key to it, again, in, the, in the, the entrepreneur's life is, you know, is that failure is no option attitude, the no fear attitude. And, you know, I've never been successful calling a banker and saying, you know, the dog ate my payment check. There is no excuses, right? So this ability to improvise on the spot in face of adversity or challenge, uh, that's an opportunity. Every, every challenge in life is actually an opportunity to change course, to do things better, to um, elevate yourself, to stand out. You know, for, for young students, I mean, every challenge, um, the ability to, to overcome it will absolutely make you shine. For us, we were a young festival. You know, we were graduating from, no, no offense to anybody, but at the time, graduating from the John Legend and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then Zach Brown to, you know, suddenly we want to book the Foo Fighters. You know, it's an internet, the biggest, oh, yeah. maybe the biggest rock band of, of our era right now, international band, big productions. Um, I just, you know, you have to be very careful. You had to, to convince managers and all that. So we had CeeLo on the bill. Uh, so it's cops. So, so you just hit on something though. You don't just call up the Foo Fighters and say, Hey, come down to Gulf Shores and hang out with me. This is a complicated, complex political process, right? Well, I mean, the Foo Fighters is probably a hundred and some million dollar business. Okay. It's not a, it's not a bunch of guys hanging out. Right. So if you think about what it takes for the Foo Fighters to get on the road, you know, there's a, it's definitely an eight or nine figure, you know, be, behind that endeavor. This is not something, hey, let's do this or let's do that. Very okay. planned, very, very structured. Uh, it's a big, it's a big organization. The, the Foo Fighters is a business. Foo Fighters Inc., right? I mean, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not a bunch of guys with the guitars in a van anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but so we, we had them and uh, CeeLo was a four o'clock, you know, very big at the time with the FU song, if everybody remembers. These oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe young, but, um, you know, and we get a word from CeeLo's manager that CeeLo got detained in Vegas and it's going to be, he's on a private jet. And I hear the, the chatter two hours before and then an hour before, and then we're 30 minutes and I'm starting to say to my AR crew, well, what's going on? What's, what's the plan? What are we going to do? And they're like, well, you know, we're going to do this. And we, trying to find somebody will go up there and maybe entertain the crowd. I'm like, who? Like, we don't know. We're still looking. And maybe this guy or that. I'm like, well, who's in the, and Sila was supposed to perform on the main stage in our oh, yeah. headliner compound, as we call it. You know, we built this beautiful, elaborate compound with palm trees and grasses and it's right on the beach. It's incredible. I'm like, well, who's at the main headliner compound? They're like, well, the Foo Fighters are in. I'm like, wow, let's go ask them. And they're like, no, you, you don't just go to the Foo Fighters and ask them if they'll run up on the stage. I'm like, watch me. So I go to the Foo Fighters and their road manager that he, now he's a good friend, Gus Brandt. I go to Gus and I'm like, hey, uh, can I talk to the Foo Fighters? And he's like, who are you? I'm like, well, actually, I made an introduction. I'm the promoter. My name is Shaul and I got a huge problem. And he start, just smiled and he goes, yeah, you thought I'm joking. I'm like, no, I'd like to get him on, I'd like to get him on stage. And he's like, no. I'm like, well, can I ask them? I mean, I don't know who you are. He goes, I'm the road manager. I'm like, well, I don't think you're qualified to make this decision. Let me talk to Dave Grohl. Wow. And he's like, stay here. Stay here one second. I, of course, stay here does not mean much to me. After all, English is my second language. Um, 
And I followed him and I see Dave Grohl in a t-shirt and a bathing suit, drinking a Corona and eating oysters and kind of like the rest of the band, like literally just enjoying themselves. And I cut right in and I describe the situation. And Dave Grohl looks at me and he goes, are you serious? And I'm like, I'm as serious as it comes, but we can sit here and talk about this for the next 20 minutes. If this doesn't happen within the next 10, it's meaningless to me because I got 40,000 people in front of the stage dying to see CeeLo. And yeah, you've got four, you've got forty thousand people out there, right? In the in the baking hot sun who pay in, good money in front of an empty stage, in black stage. They're there. They're thinking CeeLo is about to pop any second, and they're already. If you know crowds, they're already restless. Oh, they already yeah. see something happening. So Dave Grohl looks at me and he says, "Well, what's in it for me?" I'm like, "What do you want? You want? I want fifty thousand dollars cash in a paper bag." And he's just saying this to kid, right? Just just kind of like, and I'm like, "So that's so that's a throwaway line." Yeah, that's just like, I want $50,000 cash with a big smile on his face. Dave Grohl has a good sense of humor. I learned since then. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm like, done. If I get you within 50, I get you $50,000 in a brown paper bag, would you be on there within five minutes? No sound check. You just go on there and start banging away. And they and he looked at his, at his band members and said, boys, looks like we're about to have rock and roll the way it should be played. No shit. No wow, shit. excuse my leg. Wow. Verbatim, verbatim. And uh, I, I, of course, I had next to me, I was having, I don't carry a radio, as you know, Vince. Or So I had an assistant. I said, go to the office right now, put $50,000 in a bag and be back here within five minutes. And uh, Dave Grohl and, and their, their, their whole organization is freaking out. What are we doing? What are you doing this for? And again, they were supposed to be the headliners that night. So... Dave oh, yeah. says, we're just going to go ahead and do it. He said, look at me. I just need all photographers. I, I want no video of this. I want no photos of this. We're going to go up, hook up to CeeLo's, because the, the stage is set with CeeLo's gear. And he said, we're going to go set up to CeeLo's stuff. And just, I'm like, all I need from you is 20 minutes just to calm them down. And he goes, you got it. And literally, I handed him $50,000. He went with a white T-shirt and, and shorts up on stage. Um, they ran up on stage, did not do sound check or anything. It was the one and only time um, that I actually went on stage and did a public appearance at Hangout. Yeah. I came on stage and I said, the bad news is that CeeLo Green is late and will not be able to make it this afternoon. And the whole crowd is mad and, oh, boo, and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the good news is CeeLo F you, you know, because that was the song, right? Yeah, you know, F you, Dave Grohl is taking over. Dave Grohl and the Foo Fighters are taking over, um, and the crowd just blew up because they ran right on stage as I'm saying that, and they did 30 minutes of "Darling Nikki" and all sorts of cover songs that you would never expect the Foo Fighters to do. Had the crowd in a complete, complete trance. Uh, we won, you know, out of that we won Festival of the Year that. Oh year. yeah, oh yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, Dave Grohl ended up staying the whole weekend with us. He said, this is way too much fun for me to leave. I'm just staying here. I got a famous recording of him saying this is the best festival in the world that he's ever played. Right. Uh, but incredible moment. CeeLo ended up coming about 20 minutes into the set. And I hear, and I told the stage manager, you tell him he's not needed. Um, so... And CeeLo, if you remember at the time, had big costumes. You know, he had this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He literally ran on with a ketchup stained wife beater uh, (laughs) tank top and and, and sweatpants on stage, did one song together with with the the Foo Fighters. And then the Foo Fighters graciously just walked off the stage. Uh, And he did then a couple other songs and he wanted to do his whole set. And we said, nope, you're done. You're getting off the stage, son. You're out. Uh, wow. so again, great story, uh, adversity that led up to uh, an incredible opportunity. Well, yeah, in adversity is opportunity. Is, is that your? Is that still your favorite story, or are there? Because you've worked with all of them, but so who's your? Who, is there any others? Nah, this this, this one is a great. You know, the, the, there's an epilogue to this story where CeeLo wanted to get paid uh, his money, and I refused to pay him. I remember and that CeeLo at the time had uh, very uh, notoriously effective agent uh, by the name of uh, Kara Lewis. And, you know, this is 60 days past the festival. I still refuse to pay them. And I'm getting all these threats. Remember at the time, I'm an independent promoter oh, yeah. Yeah. from nowhere that counts for nothing. 
And, I, you know, Kara is probably the most influential agent in the hip hop world. And she's throwing threats. And I get on a, on a conference call where she's like, you know, if Dave Grohl is good friends with CeeLo, he would have done it for free. Because I told her that I'm, the money that I owe CeeLo, I actually paid Dave Grohl. Right? Right. And she said, and I said, well, have CeeLo call Dave Grohl and ask him for the money. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know what to do with you as a negotiator, did they? Yeah, yeah. And me and Kara have become good friends since then. And obviously we've done further business. And, uh, you know, it, it all worked out. You know, it all worked out. Yeah, well, I mean, we could tell these stories all day, but so let's make a pivot because talking about adversity, talking about chaos, talking about pivoting, as we all say in the business now, but you're moving into probably what's going to be the biggest, you know, March, uh, May 2020 was going to be, if not the biggest, one of the biggest hangout music festivals, 10 year anniversary, gigantic lineup. Everybody wants to come, sells out in minutes. And then all of a sudden, COVID-19, this pandemic hits. Um, get, tell me what happened, because I was sort of going through the same thing you were going through. Yours event was in May. Ours was in early April for March Madness and the Final Four. But, uh, but you know, you got a lot of personal risk on the line. You're in business with one of the premier, you know, groups, uh, AEG, uh, you guys, the two big ones, Live Nation, AEG. Charles in business with uh, Ann Shoots Entertainment Group. But, Tell us what happened and then where do you see the future of live music and the live events and where are there going to be opportunities for our kids coming out of college? I know that's true a lot at you, but there's that's a big live music is a massive space right now. And I'm following a lot of, a lot of changing going on within that on the fly. So first of all, Vince, I honestly believe that we don't know, you know, this is, as they say, the story is developing as we speak. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I try to hold on. You know, we were probably one of the last to say, I said, we're, nobody's going to call a cancellation until we're absolutely certain that there is no second chance, right? So we held mm -hmm. off all the way till about uh, mid-April to, you know, when it was about 30 days out and people needed to put their deposits on lodging and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I finally made the call and say, uh, and I knew right away that I wanted to hang the Hangout to be uh, continued in May. I did not even... I, not even for a second did I consider going in the fall, which a lot of other events ended right. up saying, oh, we're going to postpone it through the fall. And now they're, you know, they have to do this all over again. Uh, I knew right away that I want to punt for 12 months. Mm -hmm. Look, the, the, the new, new normal is I he we hear this term around us a lot. You know, I don't, I don't believe in a shift to a new normal. What I believe is that this new environment will shake things up and will propel us closer to different conditions but i believe that things will get back to normal sooner rather than later i really believe that mm -hmm. is based on what i what i see today i think that uh people will remember the value of socializing and mm -hmm. i still think that we as human beings require it you know i think we need it it's part of our dna i don't think we've evolved as human beings to the next phase where this new and it may come down the road uh, maybe maybe your listeners that are young enough, maybe they're ready uh, to to pivot to this new norm. But there's a whole demographic there that isn't. So I think things will become back to normal. Uh, so so where do you because we we tell our kids that the college campus is the ultimate professional laboratory. They're they're around and they're exposed to so many events going on. It's a mini city within a city. Uh, I use my experience in the you know sports information to relate it to. Um, you know, live event production as well as, you know, the sports. But as a student at a university, where and what do you recommend them doing that would put them in a position to get an internship or get a job within a major music festival, food festival, the hangout music festival? Um, what are where are those opportunities and what are you what are you looking for and what stands out to you because you know everybody wants to be in our business it's it, it's it's incredibly sexy and and alluring and and the outside looks you know the exterior looks really really good but we all know it's very hard work but give give our give our students some coaching here well i, I mean i'm not going to sugarcoat it i think that um you know live nation ag in uh, Endeavor, 
CAA, everybody's laying off people. This is mm-hmm. not a good time to be in this space, okay? It's brutal. It's brutal. It's I, I've known people that have been doing it at any at any level, right? At the from from the ground up, uh, people are taking hits all over. So I think my recommendation is perseverance. This is the opportunity where you look not necessarily at the traditional, which internship can I get with a music festival or an agency or something like that. Mm-hmm. I think what you look for is how do I create an opportunity for myself uh, to to do something that will teach me more, get me more prepared for when this stuff actually starts happening again, right? Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. is it that I can do? Uh, can I participate in, you know, learn how to do some of this uh, socially distant stuff that if... You know, you know, we're we're exploring right now strategies. We we haven't figured it out, by the way. How do you do a concert with five hundred people and an artist that typically gets paid to play in front of twenty thousand? How do you do wow. that? Wow. The yeah. That's the way these kids need to think. Is like, hey, until further notice, the old rules don't pay, and you can't bring an artist that does five hundred people because the artist that does five hundred people, you can't economically. There's no way to make money on that. Right. Mm -hmm. And at the end Mm -hmm. of the day, we love what we do, but we're doing this for economic purposes. Sure. Um, So if you can figure out what are the models, what are the what are the new ideas that can say, hey, how do I make money? How does the and when I say how do I, that means the whole ecosystem. Right. Mm -hmm. You as the Mm -hmm. entrepreneur, promoter and the artist and and, any the venue, everybody needs everybody needs to sustain. Everybody has needs. How do you come up? You know, so some people are trying the drive-in concept. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been successful in some places, a little less successful in others. Um, You know, how do you, how do you find, what can you bring to the table as a young, you know, you, they know better than us, right? They're, they're ground zero. They're the trend makers. They're the taste makers. Oh yeah. Now what's out there that you guys can bring in that we are missing, that we, the ones that own the capital, own the infrastructure, uh, on the reputation, the equity, right? The, the reputation equity that we can that we can call a Foo Fighters and say, hey guys, you know, let's try something and where, where your students don't have a chance to do that. There's no way one mm-hmm. of your students is calling the management right now and saying, I have an idea. Right. right? But if they, they find us, then maybe there is. So I think the opportunity now is to observe, be diligently inquiring and investing your thought process of what is it What's the idea? Bring me the big, next big idea. Mm-hmm. How, how do we make money in this environment? How do we reach people? What, you know, what's it? You know how many brands you represent that are looking, that's sitting on budgets. Yep. You know, it, it's like the, 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 the dam is closed and, and the water level is raising. And the minute it cracks, you know that the money will be pouring into the, into oh, yeah. the place. And, and they just want to make sure that you put it in the right, in the right spot. So tell me, Speaking of being in a position to to win or win the ball game, it's what we always tell these kids. Like you got to get yourself <clears throat> in the position to win. You got to get yourself in that five percentile of job consideration. Uh, you've got to stand out. Um, you know, you're a busy hey, guy. I'm a busy local. guy. All, what? All the people that got laid off are playing in the old rules. If they want to come in, they got to find new rules to play at and and shake mm-hmm. things up. That's what I'm saying. So that's gonna that's gonna get your attention. I mean that's 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 what's that's that's well that's spot on, guys. So I want you to listen to this because you got to you got to you, you're dealing with very busy, very smart, very stressed, very under pressure people. We're all trying to figure this new world out ourselves. But you're the most sophisticated consumer of all generations of all time. You possess this knowledge and power in the palm of your hand uh, through your mobile phone. So so. Kind of a couple of parting shots. Do you have any advice for these guys? Do you have go-to podcasts? Do you have go-to books? Do you have go-to publications? Is LinkedIn an effective tool to get your attention, to get in the hospitality business, to get in the music, to the live event production business? Let them under the covers. Give them some tricks of the trade here from one of the best. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the biggest, the biggest trick that I know, Vince, and it applies not only – to getting the job. It applies throughout your career as well. Every one of these individuals is managing a business. They're managing themselves. Each one of them is a business, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And if you manage your business the same way 
uh, as I described with lo losing is no option, you know, you just got to win, then you will end up, whether it's LinkedIn, forget, forget the distribution, forget what the medium is. The, the, the key is to be relentless is not to give up. You know, you, I, I had somebody, you know, a, a different podcast, Vince, that invite me, that invited me, you guys there? Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, sorry, my computer went dark. That invited me uh, to a, and I didn't know these people, invited me to speak in a construction, out of all things, a construction podcast. And the mm -hmm. girl that was in charge of that podcast literally relentlessly came after me for two years to get yeah. on that podcast. She didn't give up for two years. Try, and it's not that I didn't want to go. It just never worked out. The timing was not right. And right, right. We, I was not never in the same state where she was and things like that. She never gave up. She continuously went after it and after it. And she got, she told me she got the best podcast ever out of it. Uh, so that idea of like, have no fear, you know, there, your weakness is that you don't have experience. Your strength is that you're not constrained by experience. Right. Right. So that ha having no fear, but having the tenacity to go after it again and again and again and again, whether it's LinkedIn to go and, Hit me up and say, hey, it's me. Remember me? I have a great idea. You still haven't called me back. I still have that great idea. I still have it. I have a new one. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think that tenacity, because uh, going out and seeing, hey, hey, I'm great. I'm a genius. Call me. It, it's not going to be effective. I, I don't believe it. Does not work. Does not work. You know, not work. at this stage, Vince, I, st I even stopped reading resumes. I don't care what mm -hmm. your resume says. I, exactly. I care how you handle yourself. You walk through that door and within a minute, I'll tell you if you're hireable for me or not. Same thing, the virtual door. You know, if you just send me a little peek on, on LinkedIn and say, hey, look at me. I'm great. Look at my resume. Dude, you're 22 years old. I know everything that is on that resume. You tell me something I don't know and say it to me again and again and again until I take notice. I think you just hit on some big ones because like my favorite word in the English language is relentless, relentlessness. You got to bang and bang and bang. And, 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 and guys, if, if you can't hear that in Shell's boss, if you can't hear that at his level, he's still relentless. Uh, and I love what you said about walking in that virtual door because there's not a lot of live inter job interviews going on right now. There's millions of resumes out in the, the, in the marketplace. And as I tell these kids, that resume doesn't mean anything if, if, because every interaction they're going to try to have with you is a potential audition because you're going to invest time, energy, and money in a potential employee. They better show you, you know, you kind of, you, we say you marry like you date, like you, they better show you up front how they're going to be because I've had I've had potential employees chase me down, and then they, and then they're great, and they get in the door, and then they just go, Poof. and so I'm like, you got it. Relentless, I think, is the greatest word in the professional English, English language, and 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 Tenac talking about tenacity. Yeah, go ahead. One second. Go ahead. I, I said tenacity may come in, in, in close second. Yeah, tenacity, ten absolutely tenacity. And and one thing that, so we're teaching our kids, building your brand, how important it is you to build your brand, be very cognizant of your brand on social media. And the letters N-O um, don't spell the word no, it's the first two letters of not yet. So, do you, I mean, you know, they, they ask me what I do for a living, what you do for a living. We're in the rejection business. People don't understand. We get told no all the time as well. Uh, we just disguise it well once we get the door uh, uh, broken down. But so parting shots, uh, you know, words to live by, sources, resources, podcast, up and coming uh, new musician. People need to keep an eye on what, what give us some uh, parting words of wisdom here. Uh, embrace the time where we're going to be able to hug and high five again. OK, we still need that. Seek that. Um, and then. You guys have the biggest advantage at your age, the fact that you have, should have no fear. This is the biggest, the biggest takeaway, guys. This is, there is nothing, if you close your eyes for a second and look what failures look like at your age, it's really not bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you live in a country that is great, that failure is not going to throw you uh, mm -hmm. out of the game. 
And you got it. This is the time to take those chances. I, I, I think it's going to be particularly for, for everybody, but for college students and rising graduates, I think it's going to be the greatest opportunity uh, that we haven't even thought about in live events, sporting events. You know, we're talking to a lot of the, the leaders across the board, but the common theme is be relentless, be optimistic, be tenacious because they forget that uh, a one, at, one, at one time you were who they are. So, you know, and we're still that person. We're just a little older and uh, hopefully a little wiser. But, uh, uh, you know, Shaul, like I said, you, you, you never disappoint me. You're a very dear friend. And, uh, and, and I'm going to tell you, this is probably going to be uh, the most popular podcast. It's just been amazing. You know, not only just the words of, of, of wisdom of a great entrepreneur in this country, uh, you need to follow him. You need to know all about him. You need to track his successes because uh, it's going to just, you know, it, it's going to keep rolling along. But, you know, Sho Zislin, fascinating interview, the founder of many, many great successful businesses, one of our favorites, uh, the Hangout Music Festival, the stories about CeeLo Green, the stories about uh, Dave Grohl and the Killers and the Avett Brothers and, 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 and many, many more. Um, you have no idea how much our, our students will appreciate your time and, and, and wisdom. And hopefully we'll all be back together uh, hugging and high-fiving uh, very soon. So thank you so much today for your time and wisdom. Appreciate you as always. You guys are doing a great thing. Summer 2020 virtual Melt University rolls on. Show Zizlin, Hangout Music Fest. Thank you and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Vince. Hope you enjoyed today's virtual class. We'll be back soon with another edition of Melt University 2020.